But you know, when I was growing up, uh, we're sharing about angels. When I was growing up, I am, we lived in the city. We lived in Brookline, um, and we, we used to walk up to Brookline Boulevard all the time when we were children. But there's something in Brookline, and in, if you've ever lived in a city neighborhood, because that's kind of a city neighborhood, if you ever lived in a city neighborhood, there's something called City Steps. How many of you know City Steps? By my, um, my, my aunt lived in Brookline too, but they kind of lived like down further from us, and they had some City Steps, and it was always sort of scary to me. Like, they were, there were these endless steps that went to somewhere. Where did they go? And we were never really allowed. They, they always said, don't go down the city steps. You know, they were always like, they never want us to go down those steps. I don't know why. But they were endless steps. And, the, and you know, because, you know, Pittsburgh's like a mountainous. And it, they, were, they were these cement things clinging to the hillside with just one little metal bar to hold on. I guess maybe they thought we would come tumbling down the mountain. But, you know, it was interesting and what the city steps did is that they, they connected neighborhoods that you didn't normally interact with. You know, like sometimes you'd see kids come up those city steps and you knew they weren't from your neighborhood. You're like, oh, you're coming from a different neighborhood here. You're like, who are you? They came up the city steps, you know. And so you would connect, you know, it really connected the neighborhood. And we was sharing, and, you know, you remember in the series when we talked about open heavens, Jacob had a dream about, now of course it's translated ladder, but we're thinking in more terms that it probably was a mountain, but it's the idea of the sense of going up and going down, like a staircase or a ladder, or maybe even a mountain. But, do you know, Jacob had that vision of a, a sort of connecting, so to speak, and I like to think that the vision he had is served just like our city steps. It was connecting one neighborhood called heaven with the neighborhood of earth. And God made this, you know, whatever, this apparatus by which angels could descend and ascend. And there was movement. Like when Jacob saw this vision of an open heaven, it was movement. Angels didn't just lay on the steps or they didn't just sing from the steps or, you know, they didn't congregate or worship the steps. No, there was, they were, there was a movement up and down connecting the neighborhood or environment of heaven to earth. And honestly, when we pray, that's what we're asking for. We're because we we pray. Remember, Jesus gives us the scripture, you know, in Matthew. Remember, he's the disciple says, Teach us how to pray. And you guys heard this before. Our Father, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it is this idea, uh, Lord, we're praying whatever's in you know, heaven, let that come to earth. Let your neighborhood come to our neighborhood. You know, let what, how you do things and how you see things, let that come and, and saturate us. So we see here that, you know, that whatever's in heaven, and we, we kind of shared this last week, in heaven there's no lack. You know, we talked about angels in regards to our finances. In heaven there's no lack, so... Whatever, that's why we can ask of God, Lord, your kingdom in heaven, there's an abundance. So I ask that that neighborhood, uh, you know, aspect, that that abundance would come into my life and into my neighborhood. And in heaven, there's no sickness and there's no disease. There's no illness. There's no frailty. There's only strength. There's only healing. I mean, everyone's whole in heaven, every single person, right? Right. We don't expect when we go to heaven to find somebody with cancer. We won't find them. It's not there. There's no sickness. There's no cells that are abnormal in heaven. And so we see that when we're praying that, we're asking God, Lord, let that which is in heaven, that healing, that strength, that wholeness, be here in the midst of us, right? And we talked about last week that the demonic forces are the strongholds, right? that are trying to withhold that which is coming from heaven. We, we remember when in the, in the Old Testament, you know, when they prayed, he said, well, as soon as you prayed, as soon as you pray, I came, but I was withheld by the prince of the Persia. You know, the demonic stronghold withheld the angel of the Lord from coming for 21 days. But immediately, as the prophet prayed, immediately the angel of the Lord was dispatched with the answer. And so when we're asking God for, for our, the answer to our prayers, whether it be healing or whether it be financial provision, 
part of our prayer should be binding Satan, right? Resisting Satan that's trying to withhold that which is coming to us. But angels, as they assist even in our financial lives, we saw that last week, they also assist in healings and miracles. We're going to look at John 1, 43 through 50. It says this. It says, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? (laughs) Can anything good come out of that neighborhood? (laughs) Maybe they said that about your neighborhood. (laughs) Can anything good come out of Brookline, right? That was our neighborhood. And then we moved. But anyways, it says, so, and Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, behold, in Israel indeed is whom no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So I want you to understand here that Jesus uh, really had a word of knowledge, didn't he? He was operating in the gifts of the Spirit, which might I add to all of us that we, as being born-again, Spirit-filled believers, just as Christ walked as a man filled with the Spirit, we too can operate in these spiritual gifts of the, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is operating in a spiritual gift. He's able to see Nathaniel under the tree. You know, he, he could have had a vision. I don't know. He could have had a vision, but it definitely was a word of knowledge because he knew who he was. He knew where he came from, and he knew everything about him. And Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? He's, Jesus answered him before Philip called you when you were under the tree. I saw you. And Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered to him and said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? So Jesus was saying, wow, you know, one word of knowledge, which is interesting, one word of knowledge, and Nathaniel's like, oh my gosh, you're the Christ. You're the one. So I want to encourage just all of you sitting here, this is just sort of a side thought, that when you are used in the gifts of the Spirit, like, God wants to use you. And, and yes, it's great in church that we give each other words. And, hey, I feel God is saying this. And pastor will often say, hey, anyone who has a word from God come up. And they, that's spoken over us. And that's great that we give words to each other. But Jesus gave a word to, quote, a non-believer. And that changed his whole life. So I want to challenge all of us that, you know, these gifts of the Spirit are meant to minister to the lost. And that we need to use it, operate in it. Hey, if I'm in the grocery store and I'm looking at that cashier and I'm drawn to them, I'm going to ask Holy Ghost inside me, hey, do you have a word for them? Can I deliver a word today, Jesus, so that this person might believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? So we see this, here he is, right? And he goes, wow, one word of God and he believes But he says something more to Nathaniel. He says to him, most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And also, if you notice, he says, after he says to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? And I I missed the really important part right here. It says, you will see greater things than these. So Jesus says to him, you you will see greater than this. And he says, you will see the angels ascending and descending. So what would be the greater things? Well, we know that there's all these, the gifts of the spirit. We know he had a word of knowledge, perhaps a vision. But we know that the word of God tells us that there's vocal gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, revelation gifts, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits. But there are power gifts. So what would be bigger or greater? Actually, that word, you know, bigger or greater, when you think about it, what would be greater than just necessarily maybe a word of knowledge? Well, these are the power gifts, which are special faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles. And when we think of people that are raised from the dead, that's a working of a miracle, right? 
That's more than just being healed. Because <laughs> think about it. When someone's raised from the dead, not only does that sickness and disease have to be healed in their body, literally God has to regenerate all your cells that have already started to, to uh, deteriorate. It's a miracle. And we saw that happen many times, and it actually still happens today. In many places, people are being raised from the dead. We don't necessarily hear the stories about it, but I, you know, God is raising people from the dead. So we talk about this power gifts. So Jesus is saying, you greater than these, you're going to see greater things than this. And part of the greater things is that there's an open heaven and angelic activity. I want you to understand that Jesus was connecting open heavens with the angels, which is in the Old Testament, that was exactly the picture that we had, right? Because Jacob, when he was sleeping, uh, you know, his little head on that really comfy pillow called a stone. Ow. <laughs> How comfy could that have been? But he was sleeping on a stone. He saw this great big open heaven and the angels ascending and descending. And Jesus is connecting this to the greater works, which was miracles. That word see, like he said we would see, it means to gaze with wide open eyes at something remarkable, not just merely looking. And this kind of reminds me of in the Old Testament where Abraham, um, where Moses, sorry, where Moses was out in the, you know, backside of the desert, you know, he killed the Egyptian and I'm done. Nobody believes I'm the deliverer. And then he saw something burning and he saw the burning bush. And then, you know, I believe things burn in the deserts all the time. And I believe it was more than just a day. I believe he walked by that burning thing for days. And the Bible says, when he said, I will now turn aside and see, when he finally gazed upon the burning bush, then God spoke. And see, you, I think that in the world, the reason why believers don't see the miracles, they're not looking for them, number one, and they're not gazing. So... We need to learn how to gaze into what God's doing. We need to have focus on those greater things. When we hear about miracles, you know, we, we don't go, oh, yeah, that was nice. But really focus, really, really see what the Lord has done. But he says to gaze, to look upon. He said and we would see greater. That means larger, stronger, and actually has the meaning of elder. <laughs> Something elder, but it means bigger larger and stronger. And he says, you would, greater things than these, and you'll see heaven open. And we know uh, one of the definitions I liked about heaven, besides just the starry heavens, is the seat of order of things eternal. So when we're praying to God for an answer to prayer, when we're asking God for an open heaven over our life, over our church, over our community, over our state, over our nation, what we're saying to God is this. We're saying, Lord, what you have ordained, your order of eternal things, your order, your perfect order, Lord, let that order come down here. Isn't that an awesome prayer? I don't know. I think the USA really needs some order right now. It's chaos. <laughs> I mean, listen, in my neighborhood, in my neighborhood right around the corner on Taco Bell, on Cochran Road, where I drive by bazillions of time for years and years, that a manager got so angry at one of his employees, followed him out of the Taco Bell, stayed angry that long, grabbed a gun, stayed angry that long, Followed the guy into a bank, stayed angry, say, say, I mean, murderously angry that long, killed him dead in the middle of a bank. A manager at a Taco Bell. Like, buddy, it's tacos. And now his life is ruined, and the family of the other young man is ruined. We, we, need, we need the order of heaven. We need to be praying. People, we need God. We need, we need open heavens. 
We need angelic activity. Lord, we need angels at work to prevent some of this stuff. We, should be, we need to be praying over our neighborhoods that that spirit of murder, we need to bind that spirit of murder. That someone could get angry and stay angry that long and keep going into it. I mean, not, that, that there was nothing to withhold that. But we need that open heaven. Amen? It's important that whatever that order of heaven is coming down, but the greater works are the miracles, the healings, deliverance, and of course, that special faith. But it's important to know that here we have the angels. They're involved in this activity. But I want all of you to know, an angel is not healing us, right? God is the only healer. Because it tells us this in Exodus 15, 26, for I am the Lord who heals you. It's God and God alone. Only he can heal our bodies. Angels participate in the greater works. And we see that they are uh, they're there to perform God's word. Psalm 103, 20. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. So in other words, when I pray to God or even ask God, you know, about my healing or pray for someone else to be healed, the angels, when you are speaking forth God's word, by his stripes I'm healed, the angels are quick to do that word. They're performing the word, but God is the healer. Amen? So the angels are performing the word of the Lord. Another great definition of an angel is a messenger, an envoy, one who is sent. I like the fact that the angels are part of heaven's delivery system. <laughs> What's a, whatever is in the neighborhood, whatever is in God's neighborhood, the angels are loading up. And they're bringing us to your neighborhood. They're bringing it to your neighborhood. Hallelujah. Well, in Genesis 28, it says this. So he came, uh, verse 11. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night. Okay, again, this is talking about Jacob. And he says, he took one of the stones. See, I told you it was stone. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending. Now, he called that place what? He called that place Bethel, or the house of God. When Jesus was on the earth, right, Jesus was the house of God, right? He was God. He's fully man, but he was fully God. He carried the Holy Ghost. So Holy Spirit was just contained in Jesus. And for them to receive, they had to receive through Jesus, right? They received from the house of God. But think of it this way. Who now is the house of God? The churches. We are collectively, right? Collectively, together, we are the house of God. And so what lies within us, then we're the ones now who are, who are speaking forth God's word. We're the ones that the Holy Ghost uses, and the angels are listening and hearkening to what we say out of our mouths because they are diligent to perform that. Here's a story in the Old Testament, I mean, in the New Testament, I'm sorry, and it kind of reminds me a little bit about the, with Balaam. I think it's interesting how this story is told, that it's a, it's a story of the miraculous, but at the same time, it's kind of told in a matter-of-fact way, like everyone just accepts this. John 5, 1 through 4 says this, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which in, is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great number of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Bethesda means this, house of mercy and flowing waters. Okay, I think it's kind of interesting that here was an ongoing supernatural miracle. And everybody just accepted it. <laughs> oh, yeah, just hang out by the pool. An angel. I don't, how did they know it was an angel? Did they see the angel? Maybe they did. It, did you know, it says an angel literally comes down and he stirs up waters. So, again, I want you to think about this. Even before Jesus paid for stripes, even before by his stripes we were healed, 
there was healing in, in, the, in the environment. There was healing given to the people. Now, the angel stirred it up the water, I believe. Here we go, because Jacob had that vision of angels, you know, angels ascending and descending. I believe the angel brought whatever was in heaven, and the angel stirred up the water with that which was in heaven. And the first person who slipped down into heaven's substance was healed. Angels are attached and connected to greater works. Angels are connected to healing and bringing healing. You know, in modern days, they've said about William Branham during the healing revival between 1947 and 1958 that William Branham was a very shy and kind of backward person, and he would be jittery and nervous. Then all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord would show up who literally came into his meetings, strengthened him, and then there were miracles. Because the angel brought what the environment of heaven, the neighborhood of heaven came and saturated the tent. The angel came to help minister this. And he would have incredible words of knowledge. They said that at his crusades, that they would have to bring in large, huge dump trucks and fill them up with all the medical paraphernalia that people didn't need anymore. That just happened, guys, in 1947 to 1958. That wasn't that long ago. Do it again. Don't we want this again? Aren't you tired of seeing, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of seeing little babies in the hospital with cancer. I'm, that's not okay. I'm not going to accept that young men, you know, you know, are stricken when they're 20s or 30s. This is not okay. This is not, we need the power of God. We need the healing power of Almighty God. And so they would have to haul all that way. Mark Brzee uh, said he had a healing service, and he, uh, and he had friends that were serving as missionaries in Poland. And he said the Spirit of the Lord told him that there were angels working in the room that night when he was there with the healing evangelists, with the missionaries. He said there was a new man in the service who had never been in a service like that before. He had been diagnosed with a tumor on his spine. Even though he did not come up for prayer, he felt a large hand on his back, and all the tumors were gone. Lord, we release the angels to deliver to our congregation the substance of heaven. Wow. Lord, we allow the angels to put their hands on anybody in this house and in this room. We allow the angels of God to give them the substance of heaven in the, in the parking lot, in the bathrooms, in the gym, in the back room. Lord, we release their power in Jesus. Amen. Wow. Hallelujah. It said a crippled man came to the front of that meeting, bent over like the woman that Jesus ministered to in the Bible. In the middle of the service, he walked down the aisle, and they asked him what he wanted. He fell to his knees and worshiped, and all of a sudden, no one touching him because there was angels in the room. He began to straighten up to the point of standing on his tiptoes like somebody was pulling him up from his shoulders. Literally, the angels took him, and he crumpled, and they grabbed him by the shoulders. And they pulled him up. And, they, and while they were pulling him up, that spine was snapping. I feel the power of God in this room right now. God's working healing. He's working a miracle right now. Praise God. Hallelujah. One more example, and then we're going to pray because they're here. The angels of the Lord are here to bring the substance of heaven to you. How many intercessors have we heard? I've heard it over again and again, intercessors, who went to heaven and they saw warehouses full, full of body parts, 
ears, eyes, legs, limbs, livers, livers, stomachs, intestines, body parts. And they said, this is all, this is what heaven holds. And, and, it, and it's waiting, it's waiting. We just need to call forth and we need to say, angels of the Lord, you can bring us the substance of heaven to glorify Jesus, to lift up his holy name. Waiting. Those parts are waiting to come so that we would be healed. It says this in Numbers 21, <clears throat> talking about when they were in the wilderness, the children of Israel, it says they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Interesting that discouragement can open the door to things and not good ones. When you feel discouraged, you need to do all you can to get yourself out of that feeling. Because the longer you sit, discouragement tur turns, can turn into resentment, can turn into bitterness. Discouragement can turn into depression. As soon as you feel discouraged, you need to encourage yourself in the Lord. You shut the door on it right away, right away. Don't allow it to sit and fester. You need to shut the door on it right away. And the people spoke against God and against Moses why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. That was angel food. Yeah, not thankful. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses saying, we have sinned. <laughs> we have spoken, <clears throat> excuse me, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that anyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze or fiery serpent, he lived. Interesting enough, that word for fiery serpent is also the word for seraphim which are angels, because angels are a burning fire. That root seraph means to suck in, to absorb, to drink in, to swallow down. And so the seraphim are always the ones that stand around the presence of God. And do you know what they're doing? They're sucking in his presence, absorbing his power. So when they come and they present themselves and they come to earth, again, you see the uh, uh, ascending, descending, they release that to us. Woohoo! That fiery serpent. Amen. You know, the seraphim were majestic beings. They have six wings and they have human hands and, they, and their voices and they're always attending on God. We, we know this when we, <clears throat> through Isaiah, with his vision about being in the temple. He's, he's described them of having the six wings and they covered their faces and covered their feet and they were flying about and they were, they were calling to one another saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the sound of their voices shook the temple. Remember this vision that he had. And so the seraphs are the angels who worship God continually and they Drink in his presence. What a beautiful example for us. How we, need, how we need to just get before the Lord and worship the Lord. We need to drink in Jesus. We need to drink in that power. You know, I feel like a lot of our problems, we, we want them fixed so quickly because we really are fast food generation. And we're Amazon, click it, got it there tomorrow generation. Everything is just instant, 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 right? And we don't understand this waiting, 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 waiting. We don't like to wait. And I have to admit, waiting is not a really good strong point of me either. <laughs> Patience, right? But we need to learn how that, to put everything else aside and really sit and focus on Jesus and allow his presence to absorb we are absorbed in his presence, like the seraphim are. Amen. Well, Jesus, of course, when he refers to himself, it says, John 3, 14, <clears throat> and as Moses lifted up the serpent, 
in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he also says this in Luke 22, verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. Remember when he was praying. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if, if it is your will. Remember how this horrible, you know, I mean, I don't know if I could have had the strength that Jesus had. He knew exactly what he was going to go through. It was not easy death. It was a vicious, horrible, brutal, violent death. But let me tell you, no one took his life. He laid it down. Don't you think that he got caught up in some political party's idea of putting him on a cross <clears throat> or any religious group's idea of putting him on a cross? Jesus said he laid down his life. And so he says this, Father, it isn't, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel. See, we read all these scriptures about angels. We go, oh, yeah, there was an angel. <laughs> but an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So here is this angel, and Jesus knew that he would have to be lifted up like that fiery, fiery serpent that now, you know, that Jesus became the bronze serpent because all of our sin went upon him. You know, people say, well, why is Jesus likened to a serpent? Because he became sin, and he, that he was lifted up. And, but think about this. The angels strengthen Jesus to enable him to be obedient to the cross. Because as much as Jesus was God, he was 100% a man. And he, he was tempted in all points like you and I are. So even in that cross, he was at Gethsemane, he was tempted to say, I, 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 I want to turn away from this. I don't think I can do this. Lord, and we know, because he was saying, Lord, if it be thy will, could this cup, could this cup possibly pass me, Lord? And he says, no, not my will, but your will be done. And that angel of the Lord enabled Jesus to, I believe, walk out that pathway to the cross. So we're praying, Lord, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let your, he let your neighborhood connect with our neighborhood. Because isn't it obvious, Hebrews says, that all, all angels are sent to help out with those lined up to receive salvation. Amen.